Napoleon was far away from Paris. He had been promised after he abdicated that he would be given safe passage to leave France to go to the United States. But when he got to the port at Rochefort, the British Royal Navy was blocking him, and he was trapped. He did manage to visit a small island not far away, Ile d'Aix. And even during his visit, he was greeted by the roars and cheers of the troops that were stationed there. Word reached Napoleon that the Allied army had entered Paris. He was also told that the Prussians and the Austrians wanted him to be in their custody as a captive, alive or dead. The thought of being forcibly taken back to Paris and then being handed over as a prisoner for who knows what to happen to him was absolutely out of the question. The best course of action, he thought, was to send two of his men, General Savary and the Comte de Las Casses, to negotiate with the large British man-of-war ship that was blocking the port, the HMS Bellerophon. Meanwhile, in the background, feelers were put out for other escape options. Napoleon's older brother found a merchant ship that would take him incognito to the States. For Napoleon, this felt beneath his dignity. Sneaking away in disguise, this was too much. So, Napoleon's men went to speak with the captain of the Bellerophon, Captain Maitland. They told him that Napoleon would prefer retiring into obscurity, where he might end his days in peace and tranquility. And were he solicited to ascend to the throne again, he would decline it. The captain then replied, if that is the case, why not ask an asylum in England? General Savary responded, there are many reasons for his not wishing to reside in England. The climate is too damp and cold. It is too near France. He would be, as it were, in the center of every change and revolution that might take place there, and he would be subject to suspicion. He has been accustomed to consider the English as his most inveterate enemies, and they have been induced to look upon him as a monster without one of the virtues of a human being. It was finally agreed that Napoleon would indeed surrender to the British. He sat down and wrote a letter to the Prince Regent that he would, like Themistocles, come and sit by the fireside of the British people. On July 15, 1815, in the very early hours of the morning, Napoleon prepared to turn himself over. He put on his green campaign uniform, and at 4 a.m., he boarded the ship that would take him to the HMS Bellerophon. He got within cannon firing distance and dropped anchor. It was asked if he wanted to be escorted to the ship. Napoleon replied, no, it must not ever be said that France delivered me to the English. He took his time, drank a cup of coffee, casually discussed shipbuilding, and waited for a launch to come from the Bellerophon. An interpreter was required when the naval officer finally arrived. And then Napoleon ordered all that were going to come with him to get into the launch. He waited for everyone to get in, got in last, and solemnly sat down. The crew of Napoleon's ship, with tears in their eyes, shouted, Vive l'Empereur! As a parting gesture, Napoleon put his hand in the sea, scooped up some water, and blessed the crew. When he reached the Bellerophon and was brought before Captain Maitland, he told him, I have come to put myself under the protection of your prince and your laws. The British officers removed their hats and addressed Napoleon as sire. Napoleon was being given such respect. The captain showed him around and took him to the cabin. Napoleon looked round and remarked, this is such a handsome cabin, and looked at a portrait that was hanging up and said, who is that young lady? My wife, Maitland replied. Ah, she is both young and pretty. Napoleon then asked where she was from and if they had any children. On the next day, they left for England. News spread fast that Napoleon had surrendered and was aboard the Bellerophon. On the 26th of July, 1815, the ship reached Plymouth. Two other frigates were on the sides of the Bellerophon in order to keep tourists away, 
but to no avail. Over a thousand boats had taken people on board just so that they could catch a glimpse. There had been discussion for over a year of exiling Napoleon on the island of St. Helena, but Napoleon thought that was completely off the table, and now he would be somewhere in England for his exile because of all that had transpired. But on July 31st, the British Undersecretary for War and the Admiral Lord Keith boarded the Bellerophon and told Napoleon he was, in fact, going to be taken as a prisoner of war to St. Helena. Napoleon was furious. He felt that he had been tricked. He loudly objected and finally went back to his cabin where he barely left for three days until he finally wrote formally, I protest solemnly in the face of heaven and men against the violation of my most sacred rights by the forcible disposal of my person and of my liberty. I came freely on board the Bellerophon. I am not the prisoner. I am the guest of England. Once seated on board the Bellerophon, I was immediately entitled to the hospitality of the British people. If the government, by giving orders of the captain of the Bellerophon to receive me and my suite, intended merely to lay a snare for me, it has forfeited its honor and sullied its flag. If this act be consummated, it will be in vain that the English will talk to Europe of their integrity, of their laws, of their liberty. The British faith will be lost in the hospitality of the Bellerophon. I appeal, therefore, to history. It will say that an enemy who made war for 20 years on the people of England came freely in his misfortune to seek an asylum under its laws. What more striking proof could he give of his esteem and of his confidence? But how do they answer it in England? They pretend to hold out an hospitable hand to this enemy, and when he surrendered himself to them in good faith, they sacrificed him. Napoleon never set foot on British soil. And now, a journey of nine weeks at sea awaited him. <laughs>